Okay, can we get the show on the road? Yeah? Everybody here? Almost? Cool. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Python Belgrade number two. Uh, hopefully, this time it's going to be, it's going to have a lot more content than the last time. How many of you guys have been the last time, actually? All right, so it's ac actually half, half, a lot more new guys. All right, cool. Today, we're going to have four talks. Starting off with Milan, We're, it's going to be a lightning talks. Uh, sessions are going to be limited to 15 minutes. After which, we're going to have a small Q and A session, and off to the next presenter. So, further ado, I would like to ask uh, before before uh, uh, I would like to thank Stan for hosting us here and Carlsberg for giving us the. So, without further ado, I would like to give Milan the stage. He's going to talk about async I.O. in Python 5. All right? Off you go. OK. Hello. Can you hear me? The mic doesn't seem to be working, so I'll try and be loud. Uh, let me see. Let me switch to the presentation. OK, I'm Milan. I will be to give a lightning talk about the async, uh, async I.O. Uh, one very important disclaimer, I'm quite a noob when it's, uh, when the theme is asynchronous programming, so bear with me. Uh, hopefully this presentation won't take long. And uh, about the QA, we'll see about that. I'm not sure I'll know any answers that you might give me questions for. Uh, for starters, let's see what, why would we use asynchronous programming at all? Uh, mostly it's used whenever we have a large number of concurrent tasks because uh, when it's not asynchronous programming, each task will consume and block uh, whether I.O. or CPU. So in order to run concurrent tasks, you need to use some kind of asynchronous programming. It's mostly used for efficient handling of network I.O. connections, uh, that is blocking connections. So wherever you, whenever you want to, uh, whenever you need to wait for an I.O. that uh, will block your connection, in order to do anything else, you need to use some kind of asynchronous uh, programming. Also, uh, for JavaScript, for those of you who have uh, done anything for JavaScript and front end, in order to have uh, um, some kind of nice user experience, whenever you wait for a user to click on something and do something else, and you needed something else to be run in the background or whatever, you need to have some kind of asynchronous programming. So uh, where does this, what, what does async uh, do? Uh, for starters, it's uh, in standardization of uh, event loop. So uh, it's a framework. More or less, it's a framework. It standardi standardizes the event loop. Uh, it, you can write a different, uh, another kind of code that will use this event loop from the async uh, The cool thing about it is that uh, whether you run it on Unix, Linux, or Windows, it will choose the best I.O. mechanism for whatever platform you run it on. Uh, it offers the basic components for doing asynchronous programming and asynchronous I.O. management. Uh, it only works on Python that is 3.3 uh, or more. So that's quite a new technology. No, it's not technology, it's framework, sorry. Um, the, the one thing that I found that is very, very uh, distracting is the standard documentation. They are very difficult to read or to even understand the point of async IO. So uh, if you get interested after this talk of mine, I suggest don't read the standard, doc standard documentation. Go straight for some blogs or some uh, talks given by someone else. You can find a lot of them on YouTube or other blog posts. It's a quite quicker way to get you uh, up and running with async IO. And the cool thing also about async I.O. is that it gives you a framework so you can write uh, somewhat sequential looking code that is, as, that is essentially asynchronous, which is what we all want. Uh, <laughs> these are two quotes by Guido van der Rossum. Um, he, he, what he said is he wanted, uh, wanted, wants another framework that is going to replace all the other standard frameworks, which uh, XKCD uh, comic that I'm sure all of you are, uh, all of you know it, uh, had a quite funny comic about how this means that just another competing standard will be in the ecosystem. Um, also, he doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. He, he, he just wants to build a better wheel. 
Uh, let's start with an, with an example. This is a standard Python example. You've all, uh, all of you who are really doing Python have already used uh, request, I'm quite sure. And this is a very straightforward request to getting a URL. And the important thing uh, that I'm trying, to, the point I'm trying to drive here is that requests, this, this here line, will have to wait for the request to get the URL in order for you to do anything else. So if, the, you, if you have a slow network, if the uh, target URL server is uh, unresponsive or whatever, your call code won't be able to run further un until this request is being finished. How does Tornado? Tornado, you, I suppose you all at least heard about Tornado. It's a synchronous framework for Python. It's quite old. It's very good. Lots of people are using it for various purposes. How does uh, Tornado does that? He, he's uh, dealing with this using um, callback method. What it really does is uh, this print content uh, function is really a callback that you will use in the HTTP fetch uh, method that will fetch the URL. Uh, your program can go on doing something else. And when the fetch is done, it will do the print content callback. This is quite cool. This is all right. And that's the, the core itself of the asynchronous programming. Uh, the other framework that uh, can be used for asynchronous programming in Python is Gvent. Uh, and if you, if you look at the code, the get content, it's exactly the same as the request one without the Gvent. And uh, the thing that I really don't like about Gvent is the monkey patching that essentially is dealing, uh, this part here, monkey patch all, actually what, it, what, is that, what does it do? It actually gets all the code that will be run that, uh, that, that has some kind of blocking code, some blocking I.O. connection, and it will allow you, allow your code to run in the background. No, that's the wrong term, sorry. It will allow the rest of your code to run and only finish uh, when, it, when this blocking code is run. The thing that I don't like about uh, Givent, although I'm using it in some part of our system, is that this monkey patching where you can't really know what it's doing, you can only guess, and you can only hope that it works well. It's really very, very implicit. It's not explicit at all, uh, explicit at all, and we all know that explicit is better than implicit. And this is how the Isyncio does it. I'm using here a non-Python library. Uh, it's Python library, but it's not in the core li in one of the code libraries. Um, the get content. You will notice a couple of things here. The first one is the async uh, word before the definition of the, of the function, and await here. So what does this really do? With the async, I have uh, determined that this function is actually coroutine. I will talk about coroutine a little bit later. And this part of the code will wait until the uh, URL is fetched. And only then it will continue working whatever it's supposed to work after that. And the rest of your code can go on doing its own thing and not wait for the blocking I.O. connection. Uh, to me personally, this code looks really nice and uh, it's re very explicit. It's very easy to grasp, very easy to understand. It's quite fun to write, if you can say that about any code. All right. What are the components of the ASIC I.O.? First, we got event loop and policy. The policy is a bit hard to, do. for me, it's hard to uh, explain, so I will skip that later. We have coroutines, futures, and tasks, and we have uh, API for dealing with the connections themselves, that is, transports and protocols. Uh, the event loop, what, what is an event loop, for those of you that are not, uh, not familiar with the term? Uh, that essentially is just the code that goes round and round, checks for all the callbacks that are uh, registered in the event loop, uh, runs every callback that is determined to be uh, scheduled for running, uh, pulls any and all I.O. connections that need to be pulled, and then schedules the remaining callbacks for the next loop that is going to be run. There's only one event loop per thread. Uh, it can also implement the callback mechanism like you see as you can see here, the call soon, it also has 
correlator, it has weight, etc., etc. Uh, so one uh, example of an event loop is when you're uh, driving the kid in the back seat and the kid says, uh, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet? That is essentially polling. When you say we're not there yet, that's a response. And when you say I'm going to tell you when, we're, when we get there, that is a future promise or whatever. Uh, coroutines, futures and tasks. The coroutine is a very important uh, term. It is a generative function. I'm, uh, I'm sure that you all uh, have used generative functions in Python before. They're quite essential. Uh, but the really cool thing is that they can be paused. And uh, once they are paused, when you return to them, they continue where they left off and their whole state is being saved in memory. Uh, but also what is uh, very important is that they can receive values from other coroutines. Um, th this part here is uh, also very important that you don't need proper coroutine future task to wait for. Any object that you create, a class, that implements an await method, this is wrongly uh, formatted, I'm sorry, there are supposed to be two underscores here and here, so if you uh, implement an await method on your class, it can be awaited by a coroutine, which is very cool because it gives you power to do some really, really cool stuff, which I haven't done yet, but you can. Uh, a future is essentially just an abstraction for a value that will be produced later. Uh, of course, an exception is also a value that will be returned. So if you have an exception that is called within some coroutine that is being weighted by another coroutine and so on and so on, the exception raised in the uh, last coroutine in the chain will be uh, thrown around and uh, forwarded all the way to the third coroutine that has been waiting for the rest of them. And task is essentially a future that runs a coroutine, which actually I've seen uh, described as a, a unicorn with fairy dust because it's quite cool. Um, transpose and protocols, they are uh, they're a part of the framework that will allow you to write uh, some basic and uh, smooth I.O. Uh, protocol, not protocols, the code that will uh, essentially deal with the uh, input-output and um, w w what the, these are. Transport is actually a connection, a socket or pipe or anything like that is a transport protocol, uh, is an application that is in the connection. Uh, and you can see from here that, uh, for, for instance, method of a, of a transport uh, is connection made, data received and connection lost, and protocol can write, uh, close, uh, read, etc. from transport. So those two go hand in hand, and with them you can create some uh, application that use network I.O. very, very easily. That's not yet. Anyway, uh, I had in mind to uh, write a piece of code that will show up a simple echo server. Now, I haven't really done a lot of async here, so I hope this will go well. First, let's import async here. Let's uh, get an event loop. Where is uh -huh. All right. I'm sure there will be a lot more typos. Uh, not loop. Mm, no. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this actually starts the the the, the, the essential uh, get event loop. Let's define a coroutine, which will be. Don't mind me. I'm nervous. <laughs> I also have some notes here that will help me to write this code a little bit faster so you don't get very bored. Uh, I'm going to start the echo server that will have uh, a callback that will be handle echo. I will write that in a minute. I'm going to start it on uh, localhost. I have a backup also, so don't be worried. Right. Uh, what, essentially, what I've done is uh, this uh, allows me to start a server 
with a, with a high-level API uh, of streams. And uh, what I need to do is uh, define a callback that will handle whatever comes on to this IP over this port in this uh, event loop. So uh, as you've seen earlier, uh, when I define an asynchronous callback or coroutine rather, I need to use it. I need to define it like this. Uh, don't worry about the reader writer. That's standard code. Whenever it's used with the uh, high-level streaming API of the asyncio, so um, then I let's do it like this. While true, I want I want this to be looping all the time over the uh, over the event loop, so the server stays up whenever I want to connect any more clients. Excuse me, Milan, but we have like one minute left for you and All right. Q&A. All right, fine. Copy paste that. I'll nah, it's fine. <laughs> I have backup. Let, let me show you the backup. I'm ready for this. All right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So what do we have here? Let, let me just explain. Uh, so here I've, I've, this, uh, I've, uh, I've defined the coroutine that uses the high level Stream API of the Isyncio. I urge you to read about it. It's very cool. It's very easy to um, to understand. I'm uh, running the API, the Echo server on the local host, this port, yada yada. And uh, what I want to do is, uh, for all for eternity, I want to uh, wait for the reader, uh, receive the message. Of course, I can decode the message and just print it on the uh, terminal. Write the same data uh, back to the client, and uh, this, this thing is very important because the write itself is not asynchronous, it's just writes the, uh, writes the data in the buffer, and then I need to call the drain in order to uh, really send what, whatever is in the buffer to the socket. Uh, this, this part is also very important because I want to say to the loop that I'm registering this coroutine to be run until complete. The complete is essentially an exception, which I can't recall right now what it's called. It's iterator done or something like that. Whatever coroutine stops and it's done, it raises an exception. Uh, over here, I run this loop forever, and I only uh, stop it on the keyboard interrupt. And over here, there's just some house cleaning. So it's not uh, a lot. Uh, let's run it. OK, while he's running it, uh, if there's any questions and answers, uh, if there's anyone with a question, raise your hand so I can give you the mic if you're nearby. Or, yeah, Jokic can. Any questions? Come on, people. All right, I have a question. Uh, will this run equally good on my virtual machine in Linux and Windows as well? Uh, yeah, apparently yes, because I think you will, uh, will choose the right protocol for the right OS that you're running on so it will run easily. But I didn't want to run here on Windows because I'm comfortable in Linux. OK. <laughs> the, OK, let, let me just demonstrate this. Um, right now, I have this, uh, just the usual telnet. Uh, I can send whatever, and I will receive it back. Yeah, whatever. I don't want to type anything that makes sense. I can also, uh, I should be able to just run another uh, client over here. Oh. Never mind. I'm in the wrong directory. It will take me ages to just get to the right directory and start the right environment. Trust me, you can uh, use as much as many clients as you want to connect to the same server and receive the same data. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Milan. All right. Cool, we learned something new. Uh, now, Jelko is going to give us uh, a little talk. What? Now, Jelko is going to give us a little talk on how he actually translated Python into Serbian language, actually in Cyrillic. So, Jelko. Thank you, Brian. Let me hook you up. Yeah. Okay, let me just find your presentation. Okay. Yeah. One second. We need to have this on you.
Nešto kratko o sebi, ja sam Željko, dugo sam u IT-u, dugo i niz godina, radio sam sve i svašta, od embedded sistema do web aplikacija. U slobodno vreme pokrenuo sam jednu malu grupu programera koja se zove IT, skupljamo se jednom mesečno i pričamo o razno raznim stvarima, o novim tehnologijama i drugim problemima koji sreću programere. Što se tiče današnje teme, ja sam se malo igrao s ovim Pythonom, pa sam napravio nešto što bi se moglo nazvati programski jezik na srpsko. Skinuo sam Python source 3.4.3 i promenio svega tri fajla. Jedan od glavnih fajlova koji je promenjen je bila gramatika jezika. To je ovaj fajl gramatika gramatika. I tu su uređene promene tipa komanda, to je predefinisani Python statement delete, je promenjen u komandu briši na neki način neka vrsta prevoda. Sve ovo što je crveno, to je promjenjeno u zeleno. Tako da sam preveo komandu break u prekini, continue u nastavi, return u vrati, class u klasa itd. Još neke izmene koje sam radio, to su ove na sljedećem slajdu što vidite. For je promjenjeno u vrti, import u vezi, def u metoda i sl. E sad, takav jezik koji sam dobio, on još uvijek nije aktivan. Trebalo je to izbildati od nule. Pardon, samo sam još dva fajla promenio. To je ovaj fajl moduli main.c i python python.c. Ove dve promjene ovdje su kozmetičke prirode. Promenio sam samo po jedan string u oba fajla, čisto da mi interpreter nešto ispiše na čirilici kad ga startujem. Posle tih izmena buildovao sam sve to od nule. Znači, standardno pokrenuo sam konfiguracijni skript, posle skripta make. Ovaj make je radio neko vreme, trebalo je 50 minuta da se završi. I nećete verovati, bio sam prijatno iznenađen da je ovo prošlo bez greške. Znači, kompajlirao je sve iz prve. A posle make-a startovao sam make test, nije obavezno, ali je veoma korisno zato što ovaj test starte otprilike nekih 300 testova, vezano za raznorazne biblioteke, API i tako dalje. I ako ovo ne prođe, najverovatnije vaš Python neće biti potpuno funkcionalan. Tako ovo mora da prođe. Vidite ako tu nešto ne valja, morate da ispravite. I kad ovo prođe, onda možete taj Python ELF koji sam dobio da startujete i da se igrate sa njih. E sad, tako neki minimalan programski jezik koji sam dobio, šta sad s njim? Pa ajde napišemo nešto koda na njemu. Otvorio sam ovaj jedan fajl i tu malo se igrao i pisao. I taj fajl izgleda otprilike ovako. Samo da kažem da editor mora da podrža UTF-8, inače sve ovo pisanje na čirilici ne bi bilo moguće. Ovdje je prvo definisana jedna globalna lista koja se zove svi. Klasa čovek, bez V. Klasa je vrlo jednostavna. Objekti ove klase imaju samo dva atributa, to su ime i mesto gdje živi čovjek. Ima jedna, to je dve proste metode, kako se čovjek zove, vraća mu ime i jedna jako važna metoda, jel srbin, i vraća instancu da li jeste ili nije. Ovo str, ne znam ako se neko malo više bavio Pythonom, to je način da štampate objekat direktno tako što ćete samo u statementu print staviti njegov identifikator i on će umjesto poziva sistemskog printa pozvati ovu vašu metodu. Tako da sam tu na neki način, umjesto da vam oštampa da je to objekat na nekoj adresi s nekim ID, on će vam oštampati ovo ovdje što vraća ova metoda, posljednja linija vrati. Sad ima još malo koda u tom fajlu koja se zove srbi.py Naravno, kreio sam klasu srbin, koja nasledđuje klasu čovek, jel' tako? Ova klasa, kao što vidite, ne radi ništa. To je logično, jel' tako, s neke strane. Kreio sam još jednu klasu, koja se zove šumadinac. 
koja nasleđuje klasa srbin. Ni ova klasa ne radi ništa. I to možda vam malo asocijalno na mentalitet ove klase. Naime, možete, možete dodati poneku metodu ovu klasu. Naprimer, uobičajena metoda koju ova klasa koristi je pečenje rakije. Čak ako ne dodate tu metodu, ova klasa čak neće ni raditi. Zatim, klasa ostali, ništa posebno. Zatim, jedna funkcija koja je globalna u ovom modulu, protrčava kroz sve objekte u ovoj listi svi i ako je čovek srbin, onda ispiše kako se mu zove. Ja bih voleo da ova linija posljednja koju sad vidite na ekranu nekad i jednom u budućnosti bude identična prirodnom jeziku. Ako je čovek makedonac, oštampa i kako se mu zove. Iako smo blizu te tačke, nismo još, ali nadam se da za par godina uz malo veštačke inteligencije i uz pomoć možda ovog programskog jezika ili nekih njegovih derivata imat ćemo čak i to. Može. Tu je. Da, da, jeste. Jeste, upravo si, upravo si ovaj zaostatak, ovaj, jednostavno, typo, zaboravio se ne promeni. Upravo si, tako je. Vrti čovjek u svi, ako je čovjek srbin, onda štampi kako, čovjek kako se zove. Hvala kolega, tako je. I ovo je posljednja metoda u ovom modulu, koji se zove srbi.py, koji sam ubacio, da prođe sve objekte koji su kreirani i da oštampa pun opis njihov. I to je bilo to. To je jedan modul koji sam napisao i ovo je radilo sve direktno kad se startuje kao source i kroz interpreter. Međutim, nisam bio zadovoljan pošto ovdje je mix svega i svačega. Mix je nekih engleskih priručnih reči koje nisam preveo, koje nisu standardne, koje nisu standardni Python statementi, mix je čirilici i latinice. I to mi se nije svidelo. Teo sam da napravim još jedan sloj, još jedan nivo interfejsa prema korisniku, da to bude mnogo transparentnije i mnogo lepše. Da napomenem, ništa drugo nisam menio u strukturi jezika, osim ona tri fajla, čak su i ugrađene funkcije ostale iste. Vidjet ćete gore, malo pre bila funkcija iz instance, ona je ostala ista na engleskom takav kako je. Pošto nisam bio zadovoljan time, onda sam iskoristio ove dve stvari koje sam napravio, dakle taj novi Python core, i ovaj modul srbi.py, pokrenuo ih u interaktivnu modu i onda ovaj moj program koristio kao dodatni sloj, kao dodatni interfejs. Na taj način sam dobio nešto što se može nazvati potpuno programiranje na srpskom ili na čirilici. Bilo koja promenjiva, bilo koja klasa se može napisati u kodu, u source-u na čirilici i to radi. I pošto je ovaj... Ovaj novi, nazovite novi jezik, nastao iz Pythona, zbog njegove bliske veze sa Pythonom i zbog bliske veze sa Srbijom i Čirlicom, ja sam mu dao jedno narodno ime koje se zove Guja. Guja je prvi programski jezik na srpskoj Čirlici. Šta može Guja da radi? Evo sad ćemo vidimo na sljedećem slajdu. Evo ovako. Može da se pokrene... Ovo Čirlica, to je moj prompt na Linux shellu. Pokreće se sa srbi.gu i onda se javi ovaj banner. I pokažem ovaj prompt, guja je spremna za rad, ovako malo vijugavo, kao neka zmijica sa šiljatom glavom. Tu naravno kuca se sve na čirilici, nema dalje. Znači može recimo ovako da se kreira nova klasa, da je srbin dejan koji živi u Beogradu, da je šumadinac Siniša ili Nikola koji živi u Aranđelovcu, da su ostali koji god žive u Nemačkoj, šta god. Korisnik ovog interpretera kuca sve globalne funkcije koje su mu dostupne, pa tako može da otkuca i ovu kosu Srbi i on će proći kroz onu globalnu listu i spisat će Dejan, Siniša, Nikola i tako dalje. Ako ste zapazili, malo prebila je još jedna globalna funkcija koja detaljno opisuje svaki od ovih kreirnih objekata, svaki od ovih kreirnih ljudi i tu je korišćena ona funkcija underscore underscore str koja je redefinisana i koja ovako malo lepše opisuje 
svakog čoveka posebno. Pa kaže, Dejan živi u Beogradu, on jeste Srbin. Naprimjer, Nikola živi u Aradjelovcu i on jeste Srbin i sl. Još par primjera. Mom drugaru Dejanu rodio se sin Miki, pa smo morali da instanciramo klasu Srbin još jedan puta i da ga dodamo u listu Srba, je li tako? Vidite da i promenjiva, i argumenti, i klase, sve na Čirlici. Rodio se Miki, kako se Miki zove Mihajlo, je li Miki Srbin true? E sad, ovo true, to nije ključna reč Pythona, to je verovatno negde u nekom cconfig.h failu i verovatno i to može da se promeni. Ostalo za sada tako, ali u nekim narednim verzijama možda će mi to promeniti. Da, odlična ideja, hvala. Ko su Srbi, Dejan Siniša Mihajlo, svi ljudi detaljno, ispiše sve opet te ljude koje ima u memori detaljno i to je to. I to je otprilike taj mali primjer jednog malog programskog jezika na Čirilici. Može biti interesantan deci osnovcima koja prvo sednu za kompjuter pre nego što su naučila jednu reč stranog jezika. Može biti interesanta nekim drugim oblastima u svetu kojima engleski nije dominantan jezik. Teo sam da pokažem fleksibilnost Pythona između ostalog i fleksibilnost generalno open source-a, da se od jednog open source projekta može dosta toga nadograditi i napraviti nešto egzotično kao što je ovo. Završio bi kratko sa ovom izrekom. Programira i kao što govoriš, a govori kao što je programira. Eto, hvala. Dobro, ok, sad ću ja da pričam na Čirilici onda. Isto. Ako neko ima pitanje, imamo jedno pet minuta za Q&A, tako da... Raise your hands. Neko? Pitanje mogu i na engleskom, ja ću početi da odgovorim na Čirilici. Kratko, gde ovo može da se proba i da se preuzme i da li je postavljeno negde na neki repozitorij? Nije, evo ja ću se potruditi da bude na nekom githubu ili nešto. Ako mi se neko javi na ovaj mail, poslat ću mu ILF 32-bitni za Ubuntu 12.04, na kome sigurno radi. A eto, kažem, potrudit ću se da postavim na githubu pa da bude... Ovo je open source, ja nemam namjer ovo da nešto komercijalizujem, tako da... Da, IT, IT je ova grupa programera koju ja organizujem svakom... Može i to, da, da. Ovo je nastalo preveće. Da, ako nešto više hoćete o tome, može ovaj da... Mogu tamo nešto... Question? Ok. I was very curious about your motivation for this initiative. Did you do it like as an intellectual challenge or to learn to compile Python? Or are you actually using it for production work? No, it, it was just a hobby project. Uh, I spent three days for this. Okay. Uh, that's it, just for fun. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone, Anyone else? else? All right, if that's it, uh, thank Hvala. you very much <laughs> for Hvala. giving us the presentation. We're going to have a few minutes break so we can unplug this laptop and hook up another one. And then we're going to have Matic giving us a talk on how we, on SQL Alchemy, basically, the, one of the best ORMs for Python. Yeah? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Stavno sam grljaju. Ima još, ali nemoj da zvuči. Ne pitaj.
Okay, guys, I'm gonna need you to get back to your seats. Uh, and yeah, get the noise down a bit. All right, cool. Uh, Matic here is gonna talk something a bit uh, about SQL Alchemy, an ORM in Python. I'm not sure how you guys are familiar with it, but off you go. Is this on? Can you hear me? All right, try it. That's oh, good. All right. Cool. So, hi. A um, little bit about myself. My name is Boyan. Um, I've been doing Python for the last uh, couple of years. Um, currently, do not hold. Before, uh, just yeah. hit play or, or, or record your presentation. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, one second. Yeah. Just need to. New screen recording. All right. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, my name is Boyan, and I've been doing Python for the last couple of years. Uh, besides Python, I've been also doing JavaScript. And um, do not hold this against me. I'm currently doing front-end development, doing React.js. So, haven't been done. Haven't been doing Python uh, for for a little while. But um, hopefully, I can just present this to you because I've, I have experience with this, uh, with this ORM. So um, a little bit show of hands. How many of you have used SQL Alchemy or is, any, is anyone using it? Okay. What about Django, Django ORM? So, okay. Um, so, okay. What, let, let's, let's start. What, what are the goals of uh, SQL Alchemy, right? So SQL Alchemy uh, like the goal of this library is to provide uh, helpers and uh, and a fully featured facade over the Python DB APIs, because the below level Python DB APIs are full of um, inconsistencies uh, um, and are a little bit hard to use. Um, uh, beside above that, like it uh, it so so SQL Alchemy is basically actually two two parts. It does this core the core facade over the the DB APIs and. On top of that, it builds an, an uh, ORM, which is industrial strength because it, it's been developed for the last 10 years and um, uh, by really smart people, right? So also, you don't have to use the ORM. You can use just the core, uh, act as a base for um, in-house tools like Reddit and uh, Dropbox do not use the ORM. They just use the core and it builds their own ORM on top of that. Um, right, so some of the philosophies. Um, make the usage of different DBs and adapters as consistent as possible. 
um, but it also like tries to um, expose the unique features that are present in each backend. So like if you're using Postgres, like, you can uh, use the H store and the JSON, JSON storage and you can use lists uh, which, which are not present in, in other, other database, databases. Um, it doesn't uh, try really hard to um, hide uh, the abstractions because they uh, start with the idea they admit from the start that all abstractions are leaky and you can't win. So uh, they don't try to shield you from uh, knowing SQL and like you have to continue to think in SQL. But like it, like it tries to provide uh, automations for you to um, uh, like dry, uh, uh, this is an axiom in, in, in software development, meaning uh, do not repeat yourself. So it tries to, do, to, to give you some automations that you um, write uh, like short amount of code and you all know the less code, the better. Um, it also like it allows you to use expressions and to, to declarative patterns. So a little bit about the stack. From the uh, top uh, 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 to the bottom, like on the top, there, this is, there's the ORM. Beneath the ORM is, is the core, which uh, gives you abstractions for schema and types and the expression language. It has the engine. The engine is the main part that um, provides you with connections to the database. It, it also keeps a pool of connections and like the, the, specific, the specific dialect support for specific dialects. Um, so this and the, the DB API is below there. Like Engine is using the DB API and the database, of course. So a little, a little bit, so you can you can see it here visualized. Also, like this is nice nice image. I've stole this uh, uh, shamelessly from from some of the uh, presentations. Uh, many people like say SQL to me like like an onion, and like you can learn it from the inside out or the the outside in like you can start all the way from the bottom and like build up the concepts to to higher abstraction levels to to the ORM or you can start with your ORM and then gradually like uh, move down um, so this talk will be about uh, the uh, the ORM because we do not have much time and also I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on databases <laughs> so like first I want to uh, talk about um, uh, flavors of of, of ORMs, like basically there are mostly two 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 prevalent uh, flavors and uh, design patterns uh, uh, for ORMs. There is Active Record. Uh, this is this is the most uh, the most popular one. This is like something. This is the the, uh, the flavor that Django ORM uses the the Rails Active Record, which is named Active Record, and, and lot, lots of others, right? So with Active Record, each domain object handles its own persistence. So your domain objects are they they know uh, they have to be aware of the database and they have to know their state and how to persist themselves etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, while data mapper it just tries to keep the details of persistence separate from the object being persisted so like the the your your domain models do not even have to know about the database um, um, usually data mapper is the more correct approach but it's harder to implement right so uh, some of the key patterns that SQL Alchemy ORM uh, implements are unit of work, identity map, lazy loading, your loading map. So unit of work is basically, we, we, we'll talk about that a little bit later and hopefully you, you'll see it uh, in action in, with some live coding. Um, but basically uh, the unit of work is uh, so, supposed to be a, a, a wrapper or an abstraction uh, a, Above the database uh, transaction, so like you, you're in control when when something is uh, actually done on the database. For instance, this is not something that uh, Active Record ORMs uh, do very well with because, like I said, like each each object has to know uh, uh, how to persist itself. So like you usually have methods called dot save or dot delete, and when you call dot save, it immediately emits insert or 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 update uh, uh, statements to the database. You can just, you, it, it's not that easy. Uh, it's not supported out of the box to batch operations together. Like sometimes you want to uh, uh, do multiple changes all, all at once or none at all, like in a transaction. So uh, the identity map, uh, this is something that uh, 
uh, active record uh, ORMs usually don't uh, don't implement as well. What, what this means is that that the, the ORM keeps keeps a mapping of of objects um, with their pri with the primary keys to the database. So if you if you, for instance, query for uh, for the same object multiple times, or it gets returned from some subquery, uh, uh, those the, those two objects will actually like be the same. Be uh, they, they they'll reference the same Python object in memory, as opposed to like if you if you query for the same user in Django twice, you get two instances of, of the user. And if you like update something on one instance, the other instance won't won't know about the change, and they're disconnected, right? Uh, eager loading basically it, it's, uh, it supports uh, eagerly loading collections um, and uh, relationships. So we will get uh, hopefully we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, method chaining uh, it, it this is a or, or, or a generative like pattern. This is something that allows you to uh, build up your queries dynamically. So like you can you can start with a simple query and then keep calling methods on it. And you get a new query instance instance back, so you just keep uh, keep calling um, methods on it to, to build complex queries, and you can branch. Okay, so let's let's see how the um, uh, uh, what what the mapping looks like. So how can we like declare our our, our model? So SQL Alchemy like has two uh, two main ways to to declare your um, uh, model. This is the modern. Uh, approach called declarative mapping. This is more akin to like uh, uh, like the Django or M or Active Record, where you define your uh, object and uh, how it interacts with the database uh, and uh, in line. So like, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, so. <laughs> yeah. It's off now. Okay, so uh, here we are importing like uh, some uh, uh, SQL alchemy types and column and foreign key. Like these are the, um, this is how you how you uh, basically build build the mapping. And this 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 thing this is important. The base this is called the declarative base. Uh, what what when you're using the declarative mapping, you have to uh, your objects have to inherit from the base. So th this sort of looks like. Uh, active record again, all over again, but it's actually not. Uh, what this does is, uh, it, it pr this declarative base is like a factory that gives you a new new class when you call it, and every every object that you define, every class that you define, uh, inheriting from this base, it uh, uh, it the base keeps track of what's what's defined uh, on it. So when you uh, when you want to create uh, the tables, it it knows uh, uh, what's what's there and uh, what it has to create. So, to to define your model, like you have to have uh, you have to uh, you have to inherit from base. You have to have a table name, so you have to give it the name of the table, um, and you also have to uh, have at least one like primary key column. Uh, so here we are just uh, declaring a, a surrogate primary key, which is a, a common pattern. But you don't have to do this. Uh, this is also another strength of SQL alchemy. Like you can have composite primary keys, or you can have natural primary keys. Uh, it, it really just uh, tries to get out of your way. Uh, doesn't try to dictate what your schema is supposed to look like, uh, which is like one of the common complaints from, from DBAs about other ORMs, because most of the time they they only know uh, they can only like implement uh, uh, some surrogate keys, and which sometimes might might might, might not, be, not be what you want. Um, so this like uh, the uh, Jelko mentioned this already. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna speed up. Like this is uh, if you want to print it to the uh, to the to the to the console. Uh, classical mapping. This is like the old approach. Like this is possible as well. Like you can uh, define your class. It has no awareness to the database. You, you get you define your init uh, whatever, and then like you you can here create a table. So this is uh, this is actually like SQL Alchemy core. This is. Uh, uh, so what you're seeing here is the layer beneath. This is what the ORM builds on top of. You're, you're just here. We can describe the, the table, and then we say here mapper map the item to the to the item table. So wh why 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 did they create uh, the, the declarative uh, mapping? Because like uh, uh, it's more pragmatic, right? You, here you are repeating yourself, repeating the the column names uh, uh, multiple times, etc. So it's pragmatic. So. Uh, 
how to connect uh, to, uh, to the database. The first step, we, uh, uh, you, you have to input the create engine. This is like a factory uh, 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 function that will create, uh, the create an engine, which basically lets you connect to the database. You give it like a string, uh, which is an URL. You can say SQL, SQLite memory, or you can say a file handle here, or Postgres, username, password, whatever. Um, and then, like this is where we get back to the base. You, uh, to create your tables, you, you, you say base and metadata. This is, this is like the, the metadata instance that holds all the tables together and knows all the tables that are defined on it. And you say create all, and it will issue create table statements uh, uh, for the tables that don't exist already. So it will query the database and see what's there. And if it isn't there, it, it, it will create. So uh, one, one caveat, it will not alter, uh, it will not issue alter table statements. You cannot, uh, because SQL Alchemy is just an ORM, it, it's not a migration tool. You can only create uh, all of your tables at once. So when using the ORM, you have this concept of a session. This is what actually implements the unit of work pattern. Um, and this is, this is like a layer on top of the, the, the engine. Like, so here we import session maker. We import our, our base model. Um, this is probably a mistake. I don't know why this is here. Uh, initialize the engine. Like, uh, and accord, this, is, this is just for debugging purposes. Uh, whenever we commit something to the, uh, to the session, this will just print out the SQL that, uh, that went to the database so you can have a clear picture. We create all the tables. And like, so, so this, this, this here, this creates a session factory and binds it to the engine, to the connection to the database. And then you can initialize a session. So once you have a session, like we'll skip this one right now, you can, <laughs> you can, you can start adding, uh, 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 adding models, adding items to it. Like, 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 say for instance, we're, here we are in, instantiating, instantiating an, an item, uh, chocolate milk, whatever, and then we say session add item. So once we once we do session add item, nothing has happened yet. Nothing has happened to the database, but this item is added to the session. So the session knows that when when you call commit the next time, it 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 knows to insert this to the database and it's not pictured here but this uh, uh, item uh, doesn't have a primary ID uh, the primary key yet it's it if you try to access ID it will just say none um, um, uh, when you say the session add so so to add this to the database you have to uh, just uh, uh, call session dot commit session dot commit is actually what uh, issues uh, flushes SQL to the database you can also add uh, uh, multiple objects um, uh, with add all or bulk save objects. So this bulk save is just uh, performance, uh, uh, for performance reasons. Let's, uh, it, no, let's not get into this because we're short on time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, querying. This is what uh, basic querying looks like. It, it sort of tries to uh, provide the same API where you can say like query item uh, and you can call filter on it and like this name in will just get all the items that are that have a name uh, chocolate milk or beer right so you can also use or to build your filters you can use and as well so whatever you 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 need uh, when you say dot dot all this is where this is when it actually goes to the database and uh, fetches your objects and gives you presents you a list uh, list of objects uh, dot one is is a method that you can call to basically assert that there's only one item uh, uh, in the database so if you're querying like by id this this in, in, in this uh, will raise uh, exceptions if it gets uh, zero or more than one result so this is like a nice uh, assertion to, to make sure that your uh, the database is like working correctly, right? <laughs> um, so uh, you can also uh, call a SQL okay, function. Okay, Matic, I need to cut you down a bit. Uh, you need to <laughs> yeah. either fast forward this in the next yeah. five seconds, literally, because okay, okay. we're going to have a short Q&A. Okay. So we can yeah. okay, give so fast forward. Right. Yeah. Like you can call a function. So here we're calling sum to get like uh, to generate. The Literally five seconds. Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Labeling uh, like deleting, deleting, deleting items. Yeah. All we right. can say like, like, like delete and then commit. Like, it's it's uh, a pretty broad subject. Yeah. So it's, so it's <laughs> not for a lightning talk. <laughs> but anyone have any really? Yeah. Okay. There's one. Can you shout?
SQLite is a database, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the difference between SQLite library and uh, SQL Alchemy, because what? I find SQLite library very, very easy to use. SQLite, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, but SQLite is like a database that's... Uh, uh, no, the library SQLite 3, it's the SQLite yeah, 3. Yeah, SQLite 3, but it, it, it's just a library uh, for connecting to SQLite databases. You can't talk to Postgres or MySQL or Oracle or, or anything with, with I that. thought that this was just for, sorry, I yeah, didn't so know that this so, was for sorry. all SQLite the databases. SQLite is just a low-level uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, adapter for, uh, for SQLite. Just like uh, uh, Psycho PG2 is like a low-level adapter for talking to Postgres uh, databases. So this, uh, what SQL Alchemy allows you is to have uh, one code base and then you can talk to multiple databases, right? Yeah, but I was asking because of the example, sorry. <laughs> Do you have any database migration mechanism in SQL uh, Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, SQL Alchemy does not provide any migration uh, 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 support whatsoever because it's just an ORM. But there's a, there's, a, there's a separate library called Alembic, which is by the same author, uh, the same guy who wrote uh, SQL Alchemy. And this is basically a tool only for migrations. And it has support for uh, like whatever you need uh, with migrations. You can you can generate your initial migrations. You can branch off, uh, not branch, but you can just uh, uh, declare your uh, uh, child child migrations, and you can like what's up, what's down, right? And then you can you can give it raw SQL, or you can give like some sort of SQL alchemy like like uh, methods you can crawl on it. Like you don't have to write SQL if you don't want to. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. One more. <laughs> One more. One more question. Oh, I'm in my bed. Are those migrations easier than Django migrations? Definitely. <laughs> yes. In my experience. How definitely. so? Um, because uh, I don't know. I'm um, like uh, uh, you can like. Um, well, what, what makes Django hard? Like Django, all, uh, you don't have control over your schema with Django, right? It it it. it uh, you don't have complete control. It, it will create some tables that you don't want or name them or have your primary key, et cetera. And like the, um, I don't know, Django sort of gets confusing. And I've, ne I've never seen Django migrations w work, right? The way that it generates migrations, it, you can never go down or it will break sometimes. With, but with, with Alembic, like if you want, you can just write raw, raw SQL and like you can test it all, all out and you know, you be sure that it works. Yeah. Okay, Matic, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, next up we have Jelko who's going to give us a little lecture on Py2 exits, how to compile your binary files into, ah, how to compile your Python files into executables in Windows, naturally. So, there you go. How many of you knows what uh, Py2 exceeds? Okay. Oh, okay, I can go home now. <laughs> so, my name is Jelko. I'm working, uh, I'm an all around developer at LexCon. My guys are hiding in, in there somewhere. Yeah. So, Py2 exceed. You created some script or some app you wanted to share with your friends or you, you want to uh, give it to your customers, but you're, you don't want to uh, tell them to install Python to, uh, to make uh, import a bunch of different packages and, and everything. You, you want to have one uh, uh, exe file and uh, that uh, exe file should contain everything in it. It should be plug and play, ready to go. So Python, uh, Python, uh, Py2xe is providing you virtually that. So what it is and what it, it isn't, uh, it's converter. It's convert Python scripts uh, into uh, Microsoft Windows executables. Uh, executables can run on a Windows without Python installed. 
but it isn't uh, is installer builder. You cannot build the install on, on your system with it. It's uh, mainly uh, gather all, your, all, all your code and packages uh, and zip it in one executable, as I will show you. And of course, it doesn't make it faster, but some people dis uh, dispute that claim. So, Py2XE can be pain to install and, and run. Uh, it can be pain because of a bunch of different versions of system and, and versions of, uh, of Python. And uh, the choosing the right version and providing the, the all the necessary DLLs uh, it's most important in the building process. Keywords is, a, I think, all of them. I, I'm not going to explain them now. I'm going to explain them in the code. Uh, we have some options. Uh, options are providing us to include uh, uh, our scripts or for, in my example, URL handlers, packages, to ignore some uh, warnings that we get uh, from missing uh, packages we, we don't need. Uh, we can compress it, we can bundle the files, uh, and that's the sum of options. Uh, the, the other one, I'm going to leave you to, to uncover, discover, uncover. Uh, goals. Goal is to fine tune the process, uh, to end the process without no warnings or less warnings. Uh, uh, note of version for Python 3, it's uh, 09 to two version can uh, have improved the model finder uh, based on import lib and can uh, can easier find uh, the uh, your packages that are even zipped in uh, in eggs so this is the most simpler version of of uh, build pi file so, as I'm going to show you, this is a bit. Uh, no. Oh, extensive some. Duplicate. Duplicate, okay. And this is somewhat bigger example. <laughs> so in the first line, we, uh, we are declaring this is a setup file. We are in, uh, in, uh, in our setup file, we are declaring all the necessary uh, paths to create our Py2 exe, uh, exe file. So, um, in this my example, I have example file, which is simple, simple three, four line code. And I'm importing all the my uh, dependencies, all my DLLs, uh, from all my packages, I'm adding to system path. <laughs> So uh, Py2exe can pick, pick them up. I'm uh, declaring target file name, checking is there already if there is. I'm uh, deleting it and creating a new one. So this is my setup. My options, I want to be compressed. This is our uh, optional options that I'm, I'm not having uh, uh, 
any 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 uh, more that I need, so I don't I exclude those options. I'm excluding, for example, UR, uh, UI parser because uh, in my example uh, I can import it, but I'm not using it, and I can uh, exclude it in uh, in a setup. Packages, ignores, that's all uh, saying by itself. Destination there, bundle files. Bundle files, bundle files have three options, one of which I'm using. You, uh, you can uh, have a exe file, small exe file, and a uh, few bundles. The idea, you can change the, uh, just the bundles, or you can have one big exe file with all uh, all of your code inside exe this is this is uh, option i preferred and i'm when i run this run this of my code okay. so you can see it searches required mod modules. Uh, it's keeping uh, skipping uh, those that already already uh, compiled, and it gives me the message that I'm missing uh, one module in my uh, example file, but I didn't uh, didn't uh, exclude it. When I exclude the file, hmm? is it? Aha. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now again, I don't have any warning signs. And I can go and there it is my exe file that was fast so Houston we have a problem and It can be Ah, oh, there it is. So you got to juggle with it to make it run, to make it work. So I can enter this is my small code, but if I open my exe file You can see all of it's practically zip and all of my code in it. So that's all folks. Is there any Okay, thank you very much. Is there any questions for Python to exit? No, this is good. Have you tried with the PyQt or some uh, other graphic uh, libraries? No, no, no. I didn't try any uh, PyQt. Or there is uh, other tool. Uh, you asked me. Uh, have you tried to build a, a GUI library and uh, compile it to the uh, GUI uh, program and compile it to the exe file with this uh, Py, Py yeah, 2 exe? You can. I didn't try. Uh, uh, okay, I just want to ask for experience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question. How safe is that code? How safe is the business logic uh, inside the exe files? Uh, uh, it, it isn't safe. You you can decode uh, the, the uh, your your executable and uh, see your code. If you wanna protect your code, I, I suggest you 
uh, compile with Cyton uh, or, or some other uh, uh, py2xc just uh, creates bytecode and zip in it. It doesn't make it uh, doesn't make uh, machine code uh, or lower level okay. assembly. All right. Anyone else? All right. Chucky Chu. So I just have a small remark from experience that uh, we were using Py2XE for some time and. When we started distributing the, the application, it turned out that a lot of antiviruses detect it as a virus. And then we ran it to, through virustotal.com, and it's, it was like over the half. Or like, of course, it's false, false positive, but um, then we had to switch to CX freeze. So just if anyone wants to use Py2EXE, maybe better to use something else. Yeah, there is. Py installer or uh, CX freeze. Uh, there are other tools that I'm not familiar with. This is what I use. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, anyone else? No. no? All right. If that's all, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you. Uh, Okay, guys, after this, uh, we're going to head off to Mr. and Mrs. Moods, which is just around the corner. You need to follow that guy over there, the big one. Yeah, that's you or them. Uh, we're going for a beers, so you can ask anyone if you have any additional questions, any of the presenters, and, or, you, you, or you can just get wasted. It's fine. All right. <laughs>